Hello all. Today I wanted to address a video by Red Pill Religion contributor Mr. Brass who critiqued something that Caitlin Chloe said on the Non Sequitur show. Here's what she originally had to say. Um, but I do think that a lot of religious people are severely indoctrinated and have been generation after generation after generation. And it leads to poor education. It leads to bad ideas. It leads to inequality of people. And I think that there are a lot of ways that we can work these things out. But part of that is breaking people out of this religious mindset. So anyhow, I thought that I'd invite KC to join me in this video since Brass was originally criticizing her views and not my own. Although I do think that KC and I hold many of the same views when it comes to anti-theism. Hi GC, thanks for having me on your channel to uh, respond to this mess. I also want to thank Karis, a friend of mine who did my avatar for this video. Kind of felt weird being the only person without an avatar, so I went ahead and asked if she would create one for me, and she did. So thanks so much, Karis, for that. Now, with that out of the way, let's go into the statement about indoctrination. For one, the negativity of indoctrination has to be shown, not taken as axiomatic. Going beyond the hundreds, if not thousands of stories that GE and I have gotten over the years in our inbox of how horrible being indoctrinated into religion was for them, going beyond the thousands of news stories about mental, physical, and emotional abuse, neglect, mistreatment, sexual repression, rape, molestation, homicide, inequality, being deprived of education, being deprived of social interaction, being deprived of medical treatment, and all the other examples we know of in religious households and communities. Communities. Indoctrination has been fairly well studied in psychology. Many books have been written on the topic and a few are included in the description below. Based on these and many other books and studies, these are a few commonly agreed upon examples of how Christianity specifically can be harmful to children. Christianity teaches children that they are intrinsically evil, even before they ever did anything wrong. Just by being born and alive, they are evil. This can be incredibly psychologically damaging to children. First of all, it isn't true, and second, it sets children up for a lifetime of self-abuse and loathing. Christianity teaches children that those who accept Jesus are good and those who don't are bad. This can create segregation between believers and non-believers, wherein children learn that non-believers are inherently bad and that believers are somehow superior to them. It also promotes condemnation of other people and bigotry based on belief differences. Christianity teaches children that masturbation is evil, but it isn't. It's completely natural. The whole religious philosophy around sex is incredibly damaging to children who learn shame and guilt, and they learn to repress natural behaviors. This can have long-term negative psychological impacts on people in regards to their own sexuality and damage future relationships they have. Now, some would argue that religion also provides benefits to children and people. Community, comfort, hope, altruism, the idea of forgiveness, and that's true, it can. However, none of these things are exclusive to religion and can just as easily be provided without the supernatural or religious teachings. The 12-step program, along with any treatment plan, follows a specific set of rules that requires cooperation and an unquestionable belief for it to work. You clearly don't know what you're talking about, Brass. Fortunately for you, I do know what I'm talking about. The 12-step program was first developed in the 1930s by Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith, both of whom were devoutly religious. Obviously, since they were both very religious, their program reflects this and originally contained religious material. However, as Caitlin just pointed out, the parts of the program that actually work and are useful to everyone, instead of just the Christians among us, can be used without the religious horse shittery it was originally embedded in. Many programs have chosen to alter the 12-step program so that it can serve anyone who is suffering from alcohol addiction by keeping the original principles, such as admitting you have a problem and taking responsibility for past actions, while at the same time getting rid of the superstitious nonsense that originally came along with it. KC, like a lot of her anti-theist counterparts, deal with unshakable axioms that without their arguments and beliefs would collapse under. Unshakable axioms. 
What axioms are you talking about? To people who possess critical thinking skills, axioms are only axioms because of the evidence that supports them, not just because someone says so. They are generally accepted because they have been demonstrated to be true time and time again. Now, if new evidence emerges proving that a generally accepted principle is actually not true, and through the rigorous scientific process we learn that we were wrong, the established and accepted principle changes. This is not the case for theism. There is no evidence for a god or gods, and yet they are presupposed. Religious people, generally speaking, don't care if there is evidence or not, as they have been taught through the process of indoctrination that questioning and or testing God is bad and will result in negative consequences. Faith is belief in the absence of evidence, and that is the unshakable axiom on which religion stands, a presupposition to end all presuppositions, without which religious argumentation fails. Critical thinkers don't need assumptions on which to rely because we have evidence and And when we don't, generally speaking, we don't make knowledge claims. If you want to know more about the scientific method, GC has included a link to a live science article explaining how it works. Or you can look at any source of your choice. There are literally thousands of sources, from basic kid-level explanations to scientific journal articles. This will be a side rant, but I feel it's important to bring it to attention that religious indoctrination isn't the only type of indoctrination. Translation, I'm about to play an impressive game of whataboutery. While Caitlin is talking about one type of harmful indoctrination, Mr. Brass here is about to point towards a second type of indoctrination, even though it's not relevant to the discussion. It's not like we don't agree that other forms of indoctrination are bad, but that doesn't mean we can't point out and talk about this one specific form of indoctrination without talking about the others. It reminds me of an Armin Navabi clip I saw on Twitter recently. Here it is. I just I just want to mention one bad experience I have with when talking to ex-Christians is this constant need for them to bring up Christianity when we're talking about Islam. <laughs> yes, we know, we agree, Christianity is bullshit, but we are talking about Islam right now. It's, it's like going into a cancer fundraiser and saying, but what about AIDS? <laughs> right. Okay, yes, AIDS is bad, but this is a fundraiser about cancer. <laughs> as political indoctrination is just as real of a thing, and with the election of Donald Trump, it is all too common for me to see parents indoctrinate their kids to be one specific political party rather than letting them figure it out for for themselves. Okay, so don't indoctrinate your kids when it comes to politics either. That doesn't address Caitlin's point about religious indoctrination, though. And political indoctrination doesn't necessarily come with the idea that an infallible, all-knowing, all-seeing God who can't be questioned said it either. I know when I was growing up, for example, no one told me that if I didn't align with a certain political party that I'd be tortured for eternity. She's basically saying, hey, religious indoctrination is bad and leads to horrendous outcomes. And your idea of a debunk is, yeah, but political indoctrination is bad too. Anyhow, I'm going to skip ahead a bit because the next chunk of the video is just more whataboutery. And later on, I'm going to skip other parts because I don't want this video to end up being super long. But I urge you to go watch the original yourself so that you can decide whether we took anything out of context. As always, the link will be in the description box. Having a belief in God in of itself isn't really something you can be indoctrinated with, as it appears to be natural as the books Justin Barrett's Born Believers and Andrew New- Newberg's um, Why God Won't Go Away show. Religions like Christianity aren't indoctrinating kids with the belief in God, but rather they are informing them about a belief they already have. I always put it like this. Belief in God doesn't have to be indoctrinated, but a belief in a particular religion often has to be. Our brains are not wired to believe in God. Our brains are wired to explain the unexplainable and search for meaning. And when we can't explain something or find a purpose in it, we tend to veer toward any kind of explanation possible for it. Neurology has proven that our brains are biased in this way, but not to serve as a conduit for religion or God belief, but for adaptive and survival purposes. Multiple studies have shown that the area of the brain involved in deciphering emotions and intentions lights up when religious people hear or talk about God or pray. 
the same areas of the brain light up when one thinks about any special authority figure, such as their mom or dad. It also lights up when you consider other types of non-religious thoughts or beliefs. Cognitive studies have also shown that neurologically speaking, the reason that supernatural tales persist is that they are easier to remember because they are counterintuitive and they're easy to understand. For more information on these points, feel free to check out the articles from Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Cognitive Science, and the Social Cognitive Effective Neuroscience linked below. Does this indoctrination lead to lower education? I don't know how she would get that I idea, as I see no correlation between religiosity and lower education. The effects of education on Americans' religious practices, beliefs, and affiliations by Philip um, Showalter show a different case. Christians with college degrees are more likely to attend church services on a weekly basis than who never have been to college. They pray at the same rate, and the only difference is them stating their belief in God is absolutely certain. Overall, the study found when doing factors that high school Christians and college educa educated Christians, they found that they are roughly equal in religious commitment, meaning that as far as indoctrination and lower education goes, it doesn't really correlate. Studies have shown that educational attainment among the religious varies significantly depending on the religion and the region of the world you are in. Philosophers of old and many religious people today have made claims that religion is the underlying basis of social order. Unfortunately for all of these people, society shows us otherwise. There is a proven correlation between not only religion and education, but religion and a lot of societal issues, and many studies that show it from all over the world. Highly secularized countries tend to fare better, with few exceptions, in terms of crime rates, prosperity, equality, freedom, democracy, women's rights, human's rights, educational attainment, and life expectancy. An article in the Evolutionary Psychology Journal by Gregory Paul explains how studies based on 25 separate measures like rates of homicide, abortion, teen pregnancy, STDs, unemployment, and poverty have shown that the countries with the lowest rates of social dysfunction are also the most secular, and those with the highest rates of social dysfunction are the most religious, as measured by self-professed belief, church attendance, habits of prayer, and the like. According to the UN's 2011 Global global study on homicide, of the 10 nations with the highest homicide rates, all are very religious. Of the nations with the lowest homicide rates, nearly all are very secular, with seven ranking among the least religious nations. According to the Global Peace Index, published annually by Vision of Humanity, each of the 10 safest and most peaceful nations is also among the most secular, least God-believing nations. Conversely, the least safe and peaceful countries are extremely religious. Save the Children Foundation publishes an annual Mother's Index, wherein they rank the best and worst places on earth in which to be a mother based on many factors, including safety, education, employment, and other factors. The best are always the most secular and the worst are always the most devout. Also, countries with the highest rates of preventable diseases are poor, uneducated, highly religious countries. Gallup surveyed 114 countries to determine religiosity worldwide. In nearly all countries which claim religion is an important part of their lives, the standard of living is extremely poor, with low income and low education. In these countries, religion plays a more functional role in people's lives as a coping mechanism. Unfortunately, it does not nothing to help bring their societies out of destitution and only serves to give people an escape from reality. Psychology Today reviewed secular nations in Europe and found that they have low crime rates, high levels of involvement in community organizations, political parties, and volunteer groups, high levels of social trust. They successfully satisfy the basic needs of all citizens. They virtually eliminated all child poverty, they have good public education, and don't suffer from large income inequalities. Health is good, life expectancy is high, and most all citizens have health care. In the U.S., the least theistic states fare much better in societal health, including homicide rates and child abuse fatality rates. The highly religious states have twice to four times the number of child abuse fatality rates than the most secular ones. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development compiled a list based on studies of the states with the best and worst quality of life. They used information on various indicators, homicide, violent crime, poverty rates, obesity, diabetes rates, 
rates, child abuse rates, educational attainment levels, unemployment rates, income levels, rates of STDs, teen pregnancy, etc. to determine the quality of life. And it clearly showed that the most God-loving and religious states have the poorest quality of life, while people with the best quality of life live in the least God-loving religious states. If removing religion from the equation caused a decline in society, we would see that among these studies, but we don't. In fact, the opposite is true. William James, a meta-analysis on the effects and contributions of public, public charter, and religious schools on student outcomes showed even when adjusting for socioeconomic factors, private religious schools have the highest level of academic achievement. They also have a fewer gangs, fewer drugs, and greater racial harmony than public schools. So if anything, one can argue religious indoctrination can lead to a greater academic success using those studies. First of all, the only real statistic we have to work with when determining performance of private schools versus religious schools is national standardized testing, in which private schools do in fact come out on top. Keep in mind, private schools don't have to be religious. And while a lot are, religion or God belief has little, if anything, to do with higher performance by private schools over their public counterparts. Class size in public schools average about 25 kids compared to 19 in private schools. Also, the student to teacher ratio in private schools is 12 Point two versus 16.1 students per teacher in public schools. This means that students in private schools get a lot more individual attention at private schools. Another advantage that private schools have over public schools is that they are not under state supervision, so they can offer a much more diverse curriculum than a public school can. They also have more college preparatory and gifted studies classes. In addition, they tend to offer a much wider array of extracurricular activities than do public schools. Socioeconomic status is another significant factor giving private schools an advantage over public schools. Private schools are allowed to pick and choose who attends public schools are not. So private schools can reject students who are lower performers. And in Canada, we see pretty much the same thing when it comes to Canada's discriminatory funding of Catholic schools in three provinces. Quote, at this point, Catholic schooling has become a part of the architecture of school choice in the province, and it may be contributing to social stratification across publicly funded systems. Research from Scott Davies at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education has shown that children attending Catholic schools are more likely to have parents with post-secondary education. Data collection by the EQAO shows that in the GTAH, Catholic school boards have fewer students with special education needs and vastly fewer students whose first language learned at home was not English. End quote. We also see that funding what amounts to two separate school boards drains the public system of much-needed funds. KC also makes the argument that religion promotes bad ideas, which is a vague objection. Yes, ideas that don't line up with reality and promote bigotry, discrimination, self-loathing, and hatred towards people outside of their group. Many Christians literally walk around with a torture device displayed around their neck in the form of a necklace and go on about how they needed a human sacrifice in order to wash away their sins. They're promoting the idea that vicarious redemption is a good thing. Those are bad ideas. As a member of Red Pill Religion, you should be intimately familiar with these sorts of bad ideas. What exactly is a bad idea? Is it merely an idea that doesn't conform to an already assumed conclusion? Or is it promoting ideas that are contradicting all known evidence? I need to say how the I don't need to say how the first one is stupid. And if it is the second one, then with all the atheist flat earthers and religious figure mythicist groups, it doesn't seem like the atheist community is immune from having bad ideas in that context. And no one said that atheists can't hold bad ideas or that they're immune to conspiracy theories, etc. Again, you're spouting whataboutery as if it's a good argument. Some atheists holding bad ideas doesn't excuse the bad ideas found in religion. We can still deal with religiously fueled bad ideas and acknowledge that other bad ideas exist. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you, Caitlin, for helping me with this video. I've included a link to her channel in the description box. If you enjoyed this video, please check them out. She currently has 220 subscribers, and I'd love to see that number grow. Take care and cheers. Mm -hmm.